Ladies and gentlemen, before we start commence the program, and here are the following webinar protocol. For each participant ID, please use your real name following with your origin of institution. All of participants are expected to mute the audio and only unmute the video during the event. We cordially invite you to take your own firm and comfort seat in your own room and please avoid the backlight. Make sure that you have a good and stable internet connection. If you have an earphone or headset, we recommend you to use it so that your voice can clearly and loudly to be heard. During the Q&A discussion session, all participants, please use the chat box to deliver the questions. your cooperation and consideration. Hello, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to guest lecture series on SDGs. Today, Wednesday, May 18, 2022. I am Diaz from ITS Global Engagement. And I will be your master of ceremony this afternoon and also the moderator for today's session. And thank you very much for joining our session today. The core topic of today's series represent, represent the six GLS, namely clean water and sanitation, and also the 14 goals, life below water. Before we start our agenda, let me inform you some rules during the event. First, please adjust your name or ID screen using format name underscore campus. And second, during the lecture, please turn your microphone off during the session and only turn it on when moderator gives the chance. Okay. And also the third, please fill your attendance at the link given in the chat box Zoom. Our committee also sent the attendance link in the Zoom chat room for participants who wish to get an e-certificate and stamp. Please fill the attendance form 15 minutes maximum after the session starts. And lastly, participants who wish to ask questions during the Q&A answer session, please send or deliver your questions through the link that given by our committee in the chat box also. And, or you can also directly use the raise hand feature. So it's, it's up to you guys, like up to you, it's up for the participants. Okay, so today's GLS on SDGs will present a topic entitled, Conservation and Sustainable Development of the Ocean, Sea, and Aquatic Resources that will be delivered by Associate Professor Veronica Grande from Mariano Marcos State University. Good afternoon, uh, Professor Grande. Hello, how are you? Good afternoon, ma'am. Thank you very much. And the second topic will be entitled SDGs Status in Taiwan and Examples of improving water supply through research. It will be delivered by Professor Saifu Lin from National Chengdu University. Good afternoon, Professor. Hello, Professor Lin, how are you today? Hi, good afternoon. Yeah, thank you very much for coming in our session today. It's been an honor to have you both in the session. Thank you very much. And also, before we start our agenda, allow me to deliver our schedule today as follows. First, we will have an opening, and the second, there will be a lecture by Associate Professor Veronica Grande, and we will be continued by Q&A session, and then we move to the second lecture by Professor Lin, and then we have the second Q&A session. After that, we will have a closing session. 
All right, without further ado, uh, I would like to introduce our first speaker today. Our first speaker today will be Associate Professor Veronica Grandi from Mariano, Mariano Marco State University. She has graduated from Bachelor of Science in Fisheries, Mariano Marco State University. And she also acquires her master in art education and also from Mariano Marco State University. And then she acquires her doctoral of philosophy in aquaculture from Central Luzon State University. Her professional experience listed as insisted in the uh, slide, or Dean of College of Aquatic Science and Applied Technology. And also she's member of the Association Accrediting Charter of College in University in the Philippines. And also she is the associate professor in College of Aquatic Science and Applied Technology in Mariano Marcos State University. And she taught some courses such as coastal resources management and then aquaculture and also project development and management. So this, uh, so here's our first speaker today. And without further ado, I would like to give the place and time to Associate Professor Veronica Grande. The time is yours. Uh, thank you very much, ma'am. Hi, hello, good afternoon to everyone. And first, I would like to acknowledge the organizer of this lec uh, guest lecture series and also to the two beautiful ladies, uh, Mom uh, Rainy and Mom Irma. Uh, they are the staff of the world-class university, very prestigious university. Okay. Thank you so much, uh, <laughs> Thank you for the invitation to uh, render, render a lecture on this occasion, the guest lecture series. And to all who tie in in this lecture, a pleasant afternoon. And also, I would like to greet my fellow uh, lecturer for this afternoon. Uh, Professor Von Lin, good afternoon, sir. Good afternoon. And uh, all to uh, the staff of the world class university, ITS Surabaya, Indonesia. Okay, so uh, I will start my uh, lecture on this. Uh, I would like to share my PowerPoint. Can you see my PowerPoint? Yes, Dr. Grande, it's so clear and so vividly. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm sorry, pardon, you're still muted, uh, Dr. Grande. Sorry, Dr. Grant. Okay, okay. Uh, am I coming in clear for Madam? Yes, no, it's clear. Your voice is very clear, Dr. Grandi. Okay, thank you. So my topic is all about SDG 14, Life Below Water. So this is, uh, this is one of the 17 sustainable development goals established by the United Nations in 2015. So uh, the mission here is to conserve and sustainably use the oceans, seas, 
Marine Resources for Sustainable Development. So here, uh, this is the goal. I would like to repeat. This is to conserve and sustainably use the ocean, seas, and marine resources for sustainable development. Now, the question is why it matters? Why the goal is to conserve and sustainably use the ocean? Okay, so here, why it matters? Why do we need? A healthy oceans and seas. A healthy oceans and seas are very essential to our existence. Why? Our aquatic resources have many functions. So that's why it's very essential to our existence. And uh, there are many reasons to protect and make our resources safe. So first, there are over 3 billion people worldwide depending on marine and coastal biodiversity for their livelihoods. And there are also more than or greater than 250 million people around the globe have their livelihoods from fishing. And likewise, the Oceans and seas have around 200,000 identified species and uh, maybe it will rise in number or increase in number if we include the unidentified species, which include the invertebrates, the seaweeds, and algae. So uh, another thing is there are 3 billion people worldwide, depending on seafoods as a protein source. So still, uh, why it matters? So about 90% of the world's trade occurs by ocean transport. So throughout history, people and goods have moved between continents and across oceans by sea. So uh, yeah, oceans and seas serve as a world trade transport. So maritime transport is the backbone of international trade and the global economy. Therefore, shipping helps ensure that the benefits of trade and commerce are more evenly spread. So no country is entirely self-sufficient and every country relies on maritime trade to sell what it has and buy what it needs. So there are around 80% of global trade by volume and over 70% of global trade by value are carried by sea and are handled by ports worldwide. Still, why it matters, our oceans and seas and other aquatic resources provide us at least 50% of our oxygen needed. So majority of our oxygen production is produced from plankton, uh, small plants or drip drifting plants in our oceans and seas that photosynthesize, as well as uh, we have also sea grasses and seaweeds that photosynthesize and they produce oxygen for our needs. And another thing or another important or important use of our aquatic resources, our oceans and seas, it influences our weather. So the ocean influences weather and climate by storing solar radiation, distributing heat and moisture around the globe, and driving weather system. Therefore, because of the many uses of our aquatic resources, there a need to conserve 
and sustainably use the oceans, seas, and marine resources for sustainable development. Now, what is oceans and seas conservation? So what do you mean by ocean conservation? So let us define that ocean conservation is the protection and preservation of ecosystems in oceans and seas through land management in order to prevent the over-exploitation of these resources. So it says here, a need to have land management. So example, the Coastal and Marine Ecosystem Management Program is a national program in the Philippines which aims to comprehensively manage, address, and effectively reduce the drivers and threats of degradation of coastal and marine ecosystem in order to achieve and promote sustainably of our ecosystem services, food security, and climate change resiliency for the benefit of the present and future generation of the Filipino people. So that is one of the plant management here in the Philippines. So uh, why do we need to conserve again? Are there problems facing our oceans and seas? So there are. As of today, there are uh, problems encountering by our uh, aquatic resources. And these are the major problems, pollution, overfishing, loss of coastal habitats, and as well as destructive fishing practices. Now, uh, for this uh, problem, uh, first we will discuss the pollution. So uh, as much as 40% of the ocean, 40% of the ocean is affected by pollution. Why? The, the, the ocean has now become a rubbish dump. And according to the United Nations Environmental Program, up to 12.7 million metric tons of plastic made, made its way to the ocean in just one year. So millions of tons of litter end up in the sea. Okay, so uh, there we have a great problem and pollution. Another problem that we have experiencing is the depleted fisheries. Depleted fisheries due to unstable fishing, due to illegal fishing, and of course, due to pollution. And another uh, problem that we are facing, uh, the loss of coastal habitats and other human activities. And that is because of some coastal reclamation in putting up projects like establishment of commercial ports or establishment of resorts and among others. So these are things that may affect uh, problems in our oceans and seas. Now, what would be the solution for this problem and pollution? So uh, SDG 14 aims to sustainably manage and protect marine and coastal as ecosystem from pollution. So what shall we do? First, fight plastic pollution by reducing single plastic use, recycling and disposing our trash properly. And uh, it's a call to everyone to participate to a bits or river cleanup. 
uh, these activities uh, minimize, if not totally stop pollution. Uh, likewise, uh, it would be nice to avoid using plastic, or if not, let's use the recyclable plastic, or if not, uh, we use uh, paper bags in order to minimize uh, plastic pollution that goes into our aquatic resources. Okay, so maybe those are simple things, but it could help uh, save our oceans and seas. Another thing that we can uh, do is to make a campaign for the importance of marine life and a need to protect it. So if there are no uh, marine life, so what shall we uh, consume? Uh, I think uh, all of us here are uh, eating fish or shellfish or crustaceans. So, uh, there's a, a record that 100,000 of marine animals are killed by plastic bags each year. So uh, better use uh, recyclable plastic materials. So if we can use it several times, then why not use proper paper bags instead of plastic bags? And another thing is that uh, organize a cleanup project for rivers and oceans. And uh, let us include not only our uh, oceans or seas, but we should include our river because all plastic materials or waste do pass or run along our rivers. So if we can eliminate them from the rivers before entering into the oceans and seas, then that could be uh, that could be better. So uh, it's a call for everyone to uh, participate in the coastal cleanup. The International Coastal Cleanup is the largest volunteer efforts for ocean health. So uh, like we in the University of the Mariano Marcos State University has a monthly coastal cleanup programs uh, voluntarily. So all students as well as the faculty and staff uh, are participating in the coastal cleanup of our uh, here in our uh, region, particularly in Ilocos Norte, Philippines. So we have also the presidential proclamation number 470 series of 2003 declares that every third Saturday of September of its year as the International Coastal Cleanup or ICC Day in observance of the Global Coast Cleanup Celebration. So the objectives of the International uh, Coastal Cleanup is to engage people around the world to remove trash and debris from beaches, waterways, and other water bodies, and identify the sources of litter to change behavior that causes pollution and to raise awareness on the extent of the marine debris problem or debris. So again, it's a call to everyone for the participation of the International Coastal Cleanup Day. And here is our schedule for this year, 2022. And this will be conducted in September 17th, and that will be uh, Saturday. So everybody is encouraged to participate in this activity 
on September 17. So this year, we have to help save our marine, especially the marine mammals. Okay, so ayan, it would be, it would be uh, great if we could participate in this international coastal cleanup for this year. Remember, this will be uh, conducted in September 17, 2020. And if we do not, uh, if we do not do a uh, coastal cleanup, then uh, our marine mammals will die. And not only the marine mammals, all other uh, marine organisms that may die. This is an example uh, that this marine mammal had a mass of intertwined line, net pieces, and plastic bags in the stomach that caused its death. So these are the mass of uh, intertwined lines, net pieces that was found inside the stomach of this marine mammal. So that caused uh, its death. So uh, very sad. Uh, another thing, this is uh, somewhere in uh, our country in the Philippines. So it's, uh, I'm sorry to, uh, to show this, but it's the real thing that uh, pollution is so great in one of the base of the Philippines. So it is a call to protect our ocean senses uh, because this bay, as you see, is full of garbage that may cause pollution to the uh, oceans or seas that resulted into fish kill, a very devastated beach. So if we look at this, If this, uh, if uh, pollution is not uh, being solved, and if this always happen, then this may result to depletion of fish stocks. There are dead fish here. So if there is a scarcity of fish in the market, then basically the price of the commodity may price. Okay, so uh, there is another, uh, another problem uh, aside from pollution. Uh, here is the overfeed or overexploited of our resources. Uh, according to report, there are 30% of the world's fish stocks overexploited reaching below the level at which they can produce sustainable yields. So uh, reaching below the level of sustainable yields is very dangerous. Okay, so how, how can we sustainably use our oceans and seas? And what are solutions to make our oceans, seas, and aquatic resources sustainable. So first, uh, we have to work with uh, the local communities or the, or the local government units in our place, as well as uh, government agencies to find ways to protect the homes of marine organisms. So here in the Philippines, in the Philippines, we establish marine protected areas. So what is this MPA all about? This is a nature reserve where marine organisms are safe from harmful activities. Okay, so marine protected areas or MPA in short are the most extensively implemented fisheries management and conservation tools in the Philippines. 
these NPAs have been established and managed by communities together with local government units in a variety of community-based and community management scheme. Okay, so uh, what is the importance of MPA? So the marine protected area conserve biodiversity, enhance resilience, enhance fisheries, and act as an insurance policy if other types of fisheries management do not work. So uh, MPAs protect and restore endangered species and as well as the ecosystem. Example is example that we have in the Philippines is the Benham Rice. This is a marine protected area. So here is the map of the Benham Rice or uh, now known as the Philippine Rice. And this was uh, a proclamation by virtue of proclamation number 489 signed in 2018 by President Duterte, proclaimed as the portion of the Philippine rice as the Philippine, uh, Philippine rice, uh, marine resource reserve. So this is now considered as the Philippine rice marine resources reserve. A portion of the set area measuring uh, 49,000 plus hectares was declared as a strict protection zone or area for actual ground survey and delineation for Filipino scientists. So uh, the remaining 352,000 plus hectares was declared as a special fisheries management area. So uh, this is the Philippine rice or the Benham rice, and it is declared as a protected area. Okay, so coastal and the marine biodiversity of the Philippines is uh, a home to a variety of corals and fish species. So the Philippines, or the Philippine Seas are also home to the five of the seven existing species of marine turtles, 28 marine mammals, 186 cartilaginous species, and there are also species of mollusk and the other rip associated species, including seaweeds and other algae. Okay, so if we can see this picture, this is uh, these are some photos of a variety of corals in the Philippine rice or in the Benham rice. So there are beautiful corals and live corals in the uh, Philippine rice because this is a, a conserved and protected area. So if we preserve, uh, if we conserve and protect our uh, seas and ocean, then uh, we will have a, health, a healthy oceans and seas. Another, another is this, if you can see this figure, this is the Coral Triangle, which is located in six countries. We're in, uh, we're in Indonesia, is one of uh, the country in this coral triangle. So Indonesia, Malaysia, Papua New Guinea, Philippines, Solomon Islands, and Timor-Leste. So this is the coral triangle. So the coral triangle was developed as a national plan of action and adapting actions toward sustainable growth to sustain marine and coastal resources. Also, it address or it addresses crucial issues such as food security, 
climate change, and marine biodiversity. So in effort to reduce the degradation of coastal and marine ecosystem, which is threatening the food security of its growing population, the Philippines has embraced the goals of the Coral Triangle Initiative. And uh, it is as the center of the Coral Triangle, it is a home to more than 500, 500 coral uh, reef species, uh, around 2,500 uh, coral feces and other marine diversity. So out of the more than uh, 67 global species of seagrasses, 18 of which are found in the Philippines, particularly in this coral triangle. Now, uh, still, we want to know about the sustainable development. Uh, so this sustainable development is an organizing principle for human development goal while sustaining the ability of natural systems to provide the natural resources and ecosystem services and which the economy and society depends. So in the Philippines, we are using this approach, the ecosystem approach to fisheries uh, management. Okay, so one of the main approaches in the fisheries management is this one, the EAFM or the ecosystem approach to fisheries management. Ecosystem approach to fisheries management for this is for sustainable de development and uh, it, it has three components. Uh, we have here the ecological well-being, human well-being through good governance. So uh, this EAFM approach of management consider the ecological well-being of the resources. Plus the human well-being and through good governance, then this is for future generations. So we are using this and we are also teaching this uh, approach to our students uh, taking up Bachelor of Science in Fisheries. So aside from that, these are there are seven key principles of the uh, ecosystem approach. So first we have good governance and uh, appropriate scale, increased participation and uh, this multiple objectives. We have also cooperation and the coordination, adaptive man management, as well as the precautionary approach. So uh, this is like the good governance is an approach to government that is committed to creating a system founded in justice and peace that protects individual human rights and civil liberties. So it says his uh, consensus uh, oriented. This is demonstrated by an agenda that seeks to meditate or mediate between the many different needs the perspectives and expectation of a diverse citizenry. So good governance is an approach to government that is committed to creating a system founded in justice. And also uh, good governance requires participation of all groups that have direct or representative access to the system of government. 
And also, likewise, the rule of law is exemplified impartial legal systems that uh, protect the human rights. And likewise, this one, transparency means that citizens understand and have access to the means and manner in which decisions are made. So, uh, ayan, uh, we can manage our uh, aquatic resources using this EAFM uh, method of management that uh, concern its ecological well-being, the human well-being through good governance. Okay, so what is the human development goal? The SDGs are designed to end poverty and hunger and to improve the lives of the people in every country by the year 2030. So the ultimate goal of SDG 14 is to end poverty and hunger by 2030 and beyond. But we need to, we need the cooperation of everybody. Likewise, uh, we need the cooperation internationally. So it's not uh, uh, true to a single country, but it should be international. And sustainability can be achieved through international cooperation to protect vulnerable habitats. So uh, what can we contribute? Make the ecosystem healthy, its ecological well-being, uh, both human and the ecosystem. So manage also the harvested species within stock levels by avoiding overfishing, and maintaining, optimizing long-term yields. So uh, here is now the international cooperation. International cooperation as uh, uh, this one, the world uh, will celebrate the International Day for Bio Biological Diversity on May 22. So May 22 is near approaching. So again, it's and everyone is encouraged to participate toward biodiversity protection and conservation despite the pandemic. So this is now the global slogan. We are part of the solution. So if everybody will participate, then uh, we can make our oceans and seas healthy. Okay. And then, so what else can we do? We can spread the message about how important marine life is and why we need to protect. So uh, as I have said a while back, that 100, we have to protect 100 thousand marine mammals or more that is being killed by uh, plastic bag each year. So uh, we in the MMSU community, particularly in our campus, have projects and postal cleanups in coordination, of course, with the local government of our region. Now, another problem uh, facing our aquatic resources is the overfishing. So overfishing is the removal, of course, of fish from a body of water at a greater than that of the species can replenish its population, resulting in underpopulated in the area. And also, Overfishing is catching too much, too many fishes at once. So the breeding population becomes too depleted to 
recover. And uh, catching too many fish at once, so ayan, becomes too depleted to recover. So overfishing endangers ocean ecosystems and the billion of peoples who rely on seafood as a key source of protein. So uh, in overfishing, adult fishes are heavily fish, with the remaining fish mostly young and immature and unstable to produce the next generation. Okay, so what is the impact of overfishing? As uh, based from the red list, uh, there are about 1,414 species of fish or 5% of the world known species or on the red list or at risk for extinction, okay. And then uh, there are also 10 most endangered fish species that is uh, from the animal recovery.com. So without sustaining or without sustainable uh, management of our fisheries will face collapse as we have, uh, as we face a food crisis. So uh, what else or what would be the consequences? Yeah. So there will be uh, losses of fish stock. Uh, and uh, as a consequence, the, the price of fish will rise or increasing cost of fishing or the labor cost of fishing uh, may not be uh, good because the fishing, uh, uh, yung expenses for fishing is very high. So it's very then dangerous. The fishing effort is very high, so it's no longer uh, economic. So let us watch on this overfishing or the the effect of overfishing. So therefore, uh, fisheries should behave responsibly because they are major forces of ecological and evolutionary change. So uh, these are the impact of overfishing. 87% of fish species are exploited. And hence, if we are not careful, our fishery resource may collapse. Uh, this picture or this picture, uh, this is the this is an example of overfishing of sea cucumber. I know Indonesia is also a great producer of sea cucumber. So uh, sea cucumber is one of the valuable species for human, especially sa mga Chinese, or especially to those Chinese and Japanese. So scarcity of sea cucumber in the Philippines has been already noted based on my uh, studies or based on my research. Okay, so these are the impact of the scene. Uh, these are, here are some challenges and some solutions to problems facing our oceans and seas. So more than 3 billion people depend on coastal biodiversity for livelihood, pollution threaten our resources and so uh, protect our marine and coastal ecosystem by planting mangroves so planting mangroves can reduce uh, shoreline erosion and can protect coastal communities against coastal flooding okay. uh, there are also uh, regulation of uh, in fishery. So these are some of the regulatory measures that we have to consider. We have to consider the time. When, uh, when is the time the fish may spawn? When is the time when the fish uh, travel? Because uh, 
Some feces migrate from one place to another during spawning or during searching food. Uh, so we have to know the exact time when to fish our target species. Another is the space. Through uh, natural or uh, political boundaries, we have to identify the boundaries or space where to fish our uh, fishes. And also, uh, we need to consider the gear. So what are the, the gear that can be used for a specific fish? So we need to consider those things. And in the Philippines, we have a fishing regulations, like, for example, the JAO or the Joint Administrative Order Number 1 series of 2015. And this is the establishment of a closed season for the management of galunggong or known as the round scat or the capterus. And this is... Uh, uh, applies in Northern Palawan. Another uh, fishing regulation that we have is the Fisheries Administrative Order number 167 series of 1989. And this is the establishing a close season for the conservation of sardines and herrings, as well as mackerels in the Visayan Sea. So uh, we need to have this in order to protect and not to deplete our aquatic resources. So if we protect our marine areas effectively, then uh, there is a reduction in overfishing and as well as uh, we can eliminate pollution and overfishing. So we have to start immediately to manage and protect all marine life around the world. Oh, pardon us, Dr. Grande, you have two minutes left. Thank you very much. Uh, two minutes left. Can I still, uh, I know, can I still uh, have some slides, even those uh, two last slides? Yes, absolutely, Dr. Grande. Thank you very much. Okay. Okay, so the vision of the SDG, of course, is envisage a world free or poverty, uh, no hunger, no diseases and wants where all life can thrive. So to end poverty and end hunger in all forms and dimension and to ensure that all human beings can fulfill their potential in dignity and equality and in healthy environment. So maybe this will be the fulfillment of Revelation 21, 3 to 4, that there will be a peaceful future of this planet. No more pollution, no more poverty, no more diseases, because Jehovah God promises to, I am making all things new. So if we uh, apply conservation and proper management of our resources, then we will have a healthy aquatic ecosystem, as we can see here in our slide, healthy ecosystem, healthy corals, and of course, healthy people playing or swimming in the ocean. And lastly, here is the photo of the 100 islands in Alaminos, Pangasinan, Philippines. So uh, this place is a preserve, conserve, and it is a national park. So come and visit the place, the 100 islands of Pangasinan. Thank you very much for listening. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Grandi, for your very insightful lecture for today. Yes.
so thank much. you thank you so much yes yes uh, actually i uh, myself as a moderator is a very um uh surprised with the um lecture that you deliver today because it brings so many awareness regarding overfishing and illegal fishing depleted fishery and so on and so on so you brought us bring up the so many problems that we haven't uh, aware beforehand before we heard this lecture today uh, dr grande and also you have brought a yes uh, i agree that you state that we need all stakeholders to be in this together, right? Yes. And also, yes, I also aware that I, we are in in like a neighbor uh, neighbor country, right? So, so we we have borders in terms of ocean, and then I also aware that we have an exclusive economic zone. So it's exclusive economic zones that has been a sign by our president, Joko Widodo, and also President Rodrigo Duterte. Yes, it's, 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 um, it's very important because we need stakeholder to um, make the rule first, and then we will start from there to gain or achieve the goal of 14 life below water. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Grandi, for your very insightful uh, lecture today. Thank you. So, Thank you. Uh, yeah, so we would like to uh, open the Q&A session, start from now, uh, for all the participants who wish to ask questions. Please fill in the uh, link that has been sent to you, or you can simply use the raise hand feature in Zoom meeting. Okay, now I will open the link that contains a questions. Now we have first questions, Dr. Grande, let me deliver it to you the first one. Yes, question. yes, ma'am. Yeah, actually, if from Aulia Harumi from ITS. The question is, is there any link between ocean health and climate change? Uh, climate change and... Uh, climate change and ocean health, uh, Dr. Grandi. Uh, yes, because... Uh, uh, climate change has something to do with the activities of uh, or anthropogenic activities, like for example, uh, fossil burning of fossil fuels. This is uh, the production of energy that may affect the acidity or acidification of our oceans and seas. And that make also a pollution for our organic, uh, of our ocean animals. Okay, thank you very much for your answer, uh, Dr. Grande. And I would like to invite Aulia Harumi for giving a response to our speaker's answer. Okay, for Aulia Harumi. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you clear. Yeah, uh, I think uh, it's already answered. Thank you. Okay, Thank so. You. Thank you. So no more questions for, from Aulia. It's pretty clear. All right. So let's proceed to the next question, Dr. Grande. Let me read you the second question. Uh, so Dr. Grande, we have a aware about many uh, solutions regarding a fishery, illegal fishery, and so on and so on. And also it's 
very good that you state approaches in fisheries management, right, Dr. Brandy? Yes, ma'am. Yes. Uh, yes, how, uh, however, the, the problem is how, how to raise awareness of the people, the people to change their behavior. So uh, we, 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 we aware that uh, humans uh, uh, make this, this destruction in this nature, right, uh, Dr. Brandy? So, um, the question is how to raise awareness to the people itself okay. to to encourage them to keep the nature intake or keep the nature safe and not distract them. Yes, ma'am. So what we are doing here in our place is that we have uh, a campaign regarding the uh, conservation of our uh, marine resources as well as we have uh, uh, have trainings and uh, coastal resource management conducted in, uh, by our extension uh, directory so we have our uh, massive campaign on resource management. And aside from that, uh, coastal resource management is also a, a part of our curriculum in the Bachelor of Science in Fisheries. So all our students are teach on how to conserve and manage our aquatic resources. Very interesting. Thank you very much for your answer and explanation, Dr. Grande. So it becomes a curriculum in the academic uh, world, right? Yes, it is included in our curriculum. Yes, and also Philippines provides Ben Ham rights for taking the Filipino scientists, right, uh, Dr. Grande? Yes, uh, uh, scientists uh, are... Uh, allowed to do research also and uh, this output from research are being used for managing the uh, aquatic resources not only in the philippine rice but as well as other aquatic resources in the philippines yes yeah, so that 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 was uh, amazing uh, dr grande and also philippines also have international Coastal clean up day schedule, wow, once a yes. year. Oh, very, once a year. And it, yes, it is scheduled on uh, September 7th, uh, 2020. So it would be nice if all countries having uh, a coastal or marine resources or any aquatic resources may participate in the international clean up day. Thank you very much, Dr. Grandy, for your insightful uh, answer today. And then another question. Um, let's ask, proceed to the next question. This is the last question, uh, Dr. Grandy. The question is, how is the Philippine government um, deal with illegal fishing? Uh, by the question means the policy. What kind of policy that governments of Philippine make or uh, construct to deal with illegal fishing? Is there any like an umbrella, uh, legal umbrella for, for that matters, Dr. Grandi? Okay, so uh, before illegal fishing is rampant, particularly, or here in our locality, there are dynamite fishing, there are bus uh, fishing, but as of now, because of the uh, policies, those that we have, in our local government union, we have also our maritime and the coast guard that will help implement the different laws to uh, stop illegal fishing in our own place. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Grandy, for your answer. And then, um, yeah, thank you very much, Dr. Grandy. Uh, let's. Uh, we will close this Q&A session and we will proceed to the next agenda. Once again, thank you very much, Dr. Grandi, and we will proceed. Thank you. <laughs> thank you so much, ma'am.
I'm uh, I'm so much happy for the invitation on this uh, guest lecture series. Thank you so much. The honor is on us, uh, Dr. Grandi. Thank you very much. And now let's proceed to the next agenda. Okay, before we proceed to the next agenda, now we will have a certificate of appreciation. This certificate is for Associate Professor Veronica Grandi. Thank you. Once again, thank you very much, uh, Associate Professor Veronica Grandi, for your very, very insightful lecture today. We believe that your lecture will be beneficial to our all participants today. And then let's proceed to the next agenda. This will be the second lecture that will be delivered by Professor Sai Furhin from National Chengdu University. Before we listen to the lecture, allow me to introduce our speaker first. Professor Sai Furhin has graduated from National Chengdu University and acquired his BS and MS from National Taiwan University. And he also acquired PhD from University of California. And his professional experience, including chair professor in the Department of Environmental Engineering. And he was also vice president for research and development at National Champion University. He acquired awards such as the Outstanding Research Award from Taiwan Ministry of Science and Technology, and also Ho Chi Three Outstanding Award for Environmental Protection, and also Excellent and Outstanding Teaching and Research Award from NCHK. His research interests including identification, treatment and modeling of cyanobacteria and metabolites in drinking water system, and also absorption and novel treatment techniques for contaminated groundwater. Be without further ado, I would like to please our second lecturer today. Hello, Professor Lin. Hi. Hello, hello, Ms. Chialedi. Hello, Professor. Uh, we are looking forward for your lecture today. And for Dr. Professor Lin, I would give you the time and also the space. Thank you very much. Uh, let me share my slide uh, first. OK. Do you have a problem to see my slide? We can see it clearly, uh, Prof. Lin. Thank okay, you. Uh, thank you very much. So uh, let, me, uh, let me start my uh, presentation. Uh, first of all, I would like to uh, thank uh, ITS for organizing this uh, workshop and, and this lecture. And also thank you the, uh, the organizer for uh, the uh, uh, GLS and ITS. Uh, to invite me to give this speech. And also uh, thank you, because you know, uh, I have long-term kind of a, a collaboration with ITS and we have a few uh, very good friends over there. And I would like to say hello to you too. Okay, for uh, today's uh, uh, lecture, uh, my topic is as the uh, SDG status in Taiwan. And, and I would also uh, like to introduce a few examples of uh, improving uh, water supply uh, through uh, research. Okay, uh, this is the outline uh, that uh, I have. Uh, I would like to uh, first start uh, to introduce about the SDG 6 and the status uh, in Taiwan. And then uh, I will uh, uh, go to some of the examples, uh, including uh, my research group and, and also the research group in the NCKU, uh, primarily uh, focusing on the uh, uh, sound and bacteria type of marketing and treatment technology, and then some extension to uh, river pollution uh, monitoring and water resources management and uh, wastewater treatment uh, technology. Okay, this slide was uh, 
uh, proposed by uh, uh, Professor Richard uh, Smiley, uh, who is the uh, Nobel Prize uh, Lauren in chemistry. And back to uh, almost 20 years ago, uh, he mentioned that uh, the humanity uh, over the next 50 years are facing with the two uh, 10 top you know, uh, problems. And if you see this water is the second one. So water has already become a very important issues. Of course, you know, uh, because of the uh, uh, Russian invasion of Ukraine, as well as the uh, COVID-19, I think the terrorism and war, as well as the disease will move up, you know, to uh, also a very important uh, issues. But our today, today our focus will be water. Okay, this is the uh, 17 uh, uh, UN SDG goals uh, proposed in 2015. And uh, what our focus today in my lecture will be the clean water and, and sanitation. So uh, let's back to uh, Taiwan uh, about what uh, uh, our you know, uh, target and, and indicators you know, set, set up for the uh, clean water and sanitation. Uh, for UN, uh, the major uh, SDG goal is clean water and sanitation only. But in Taiwan, we actually, uh, of course, the main uh, theme is still the clean water and sanitation, but we add air quality uh, protection as well as the waste recycling and reuse into this SDG 6. But today I will mainly focus on water and sanitation. Okay, this shows the uh, targets and indicators for the uh, uh, SDG 6 uh, in Taiwan. The first one would be the high quality uh, drinking water. So we focus on the water supply uh, coverage, try to spread our people with the uh, uh, good uh, water supply and good tap water. And the second one is the sanitation and public toilet. The indicator of uh, the, if the, if the, the uh, target has been met is the excellent quality of public uh, toilet spreading around uh, the other uh, country. And the third one is the uh, protection of rivers. So uh, we have eight indicators uh, try to uh, to show the protection of a river, including the sewage connection uh, ratio, the wastewater treatment ratio, and the create reclaimed water in amount and quantity, the quantity and ratios that we use, and then the compliance of urban uh, water quality from industry, and also uh, the uh, uh, BOD and heavy metals in the fifty uh, major rivers. Uh, in Taiwan, we try to see you know, how many of them has compliance with the uh, national water, uh, real water quality standard, and also the uh, chemical tracking uh, cases. And for 6.4, which is the, uh, uh, the efficiency of uh, water usage, for example, we monitor the uh, public water supply and how much you know, recycling has been done by the industry, and also how much uh, water has been recycled in the process of water of the major science-based industrial park in you know, spreading in Taiwan. And also we try to re release, uh, re so to reduce the leakage of water that should be a system for drinking water supply. And also uh, try to uh, roll down the uh, uh, water usage pressure in Taiwan because every year, uh, occasionally we might have some uh, pressure uh, because of the water shortage. And the fifth point is the, compli uh, the uh, comprehensive water uh, resources management. Uh, we have developed national plans for water supply you know, stability to ensure that we have stable water supply. And the sixth item is the river, soil, and sediment uh, protection. For example, we calculate the land subsiding uh, area along the coastal area of Taiwan. And we monitor the eutrophication status of the 20 major uh, reservoirs in Taiwan. And also we monitor and hopefully remediation of the uh, sediments uh, in, uh, in the major rivers. And also try to remove the uh, soil and soil and groundwater contaminated sites. And then also uh, try to protection of the uh, coastal area. For the, uh, for the A to E, the first two are including, uh, <clears throat> including the international society kind of a, a collaboration. And then the B is the uh, community involvement uh, in river protection. For example, we have more than about 20 volunteer water protection uh, teams spreading uh, 
on the island try to protect even uh, rivers. And then also, as I mentioned, that the uh, six, six point C, D, and E are many relevant to air quality and the uh, general waste and industrial uh, waste. Okay, this is the uh, uh, status uh, in 2020, as well, uh, just you know, uh, one and a half years ago, because for 2021, I think the number has not been kind of released completely yet. So uh, for drinking water uh, coverage, uh, about 94.8 or 94.9 percent of the people in the island were, uh, were supplied with the uh, uh, public water supply uh, system, and the original goal was uh, 90 94.7 in uh, uh, 2013. Obviously, it has been achieved already. But I think it will be very difficult to move, you know, kind of a, to get a higher ratio because we have a lot of people who are living in very, very remote areas, such as in the mountain, or in the, uh, it will be very difficult to supply them, you know, with the public water supply. And also for recycling of general waste, this represents the waste produced by a household as well as the, uh, uh, the stores. And, and the recycling rate is about 60, almost 63% uh, uh, right now. It's close to the, uh, uh, the, top, the, the goal in 2030, which is 65. And the third one is the uh, connection to a uh, sewage uh, system. Uh, I think this is the uh, quite a low, you know, kind of a value in Taiwan. Uh, it's much lower than uh, yeah, Western uh, countries. So this is something we need to do. Uh, our goal in 2030 is about 46 percent, and now already it's higher than the 2020 uh, kind of a, a goal of 36 percent, which is almost 38 percent. But I think we still have quite a long way to go uh, to reach in a higher uh, ratio, like in Western uh, countries. Okay, uh, what about uh, others? Uh, for drinking water relevant, uh, now we uh, are. Uh, Water usage per capita per day is about 265, which is also a bit high compared to in the most recent uh, countries. But our goal is about 250 in uh, 2030, so we still have some you know, long distance to go to in order to reduce uh, the uh, water uh, kind of usage down to 250 liter per day per capita. And then for liquid uh, rate of distribution system, uh, we used to have more than 30% of leakage rate, which is very, very, very high. But uh, in uh, the two major water supply uh, system in Taiwan, uh, one is the Taipei Water Department, the other one is Taiwan Water Corporation. Uh, they have reached about 12% and 40% respectively in 2020. And this already slightly lower than uh, what was kind of a, uh, established uh, for the goal in 2020, but uh, in 2030, uh, we still need to do a bit more, you know, so that we can reduce to less than about 10%. Uh, for loss, you know, uh, leakage uh, rate, if you want to be becoming a lower than uh, 10%, it'll be you know, much, much more difficult compared to, you know, from 30% to uh, 10%. And also uh, the reclaimed water. And actually, I think the reclaimed water, the volume, uh, the quantity of reclaimed water produced uh, per day right now is about 4.5 million tons you know, per day in Taiwan. And although this is equivalent to the goal set up for 2020, but I think it's still uh, low uh, because you know a lot of the water has not really been uh, treated properly and then recycled back into uh, the uh, uh, proper you know, process. So we have a lot of you know, business for this goal uh, too. Okay, now, you know, uh, give you a little bit of background about the uh, SDG 6. So what uh, the next one I'm going to talk about is about the research part. So uh, in uh, uh, my, my research, you know, interest and expertise, you know, are relevant to uh, sound of bacteria in drinking water sources. So uh, to start with, I would like to show you a few uh, photos. So this is the uh, slide, the, the uh, photos I took in, uh, my Panga Reservoir in South Australia. And you can see that uh, they have a floating uh, mat of uh, salad bacteria. So in Australia, in many of the reservoirs, they actually plate, you know, like last one. So don't drink the water, don't fishing, don't boring, and don't swimming, and don't allow your dog to drink 
uh, the water because you know in many cases you know uh, those water with room floating on top will have you know some toxins that will kill the dogs. All right, and this is a, a photo I took in uh, in uh, India. It's in a very, very you know uh, luxury and expensive you know, golf court, but you can see that. Uh, they actually have very high in phosphorus concentration in the water. So the, uh, the algal bloom are very serious and causing a, a very uh, a sad you know, uh, issues for the, for the uh, ponds. And this photo was taken uh, from Dianqi, uh, uh, China. And it's a big you know, lake, about 900 kilometers square of lake. And we see that you know, when I uh, sat in the gondola, on the top, and I took the photo, and you see that a lot of the algal uh, cyanobacteria bloom, you know, floating on top of it. And even if a boat try to collect the algal bloom regularly, and this is uh, this is in in South Korea, in one of the uh, major uh, river in Nankong River. It shows that they also have serious, you know, algal bloom floating on top of the river. And this is the. Uh, uh, a news from uh, uh, Philippine, the Star, which is a major uh, newspaper in uh, in Manila, it shows that you know Elgo uh, Manila is a water supply corporation in, in Manila City. Okay, it shows L LG behind a major uh, order and test. You can see that the people actually grow fish in the Laguna de Bay here, which is the second largest uh, lake in Southeastern Asia, with an area of 900 kilometers square. And, and and you see that you know they actually have quite a serious in you know, bloom uh, uh, on top of that, and and Laguna de Bay is one of the uh, water uh, sources for for uh, Metro Manila uh, city. Okay, so when we uh, went there and took the sample, you can actually see that in all these you know algo you know uh, colonies floating on the water. So one of my students actually uh, tried to uh, find out all the literature published relevant to cyanobacteria, especially about the toxins and taste and other compounds and plot a, a world map on top of this, uh, this. And it shows that it's almost everywhere. In many countries, you can see a lot of uh, cyanotoxins or taste and other compound called jasmine, it might be uh, present around the world. And what about uh, back to Taiwan? Uh, in the last about almost 20 years, we have uh, sampling a lot of reservoirs and, and uh, try to understand about the status of cyanobacteria toxins and taste of local compounds uh, in Taiwan's water. And each of the points represent one uh, reservoir. And we can see that in many of the places, especially in the uh, offshore uh, islands, Mazu, Kimmen, and, and Penghu, all this, you know, data are in red. Red represent uh, high, either high uh, kind of a potential of cyanotoxins or taste and other compound or gross potential for cyanobacteria. And you see that in, uh, in the south uh, uh, part of Taiwan, where my university is located, as well as in the, uh, uh, in the offshore islands, you can see that a lot of red, you know, uh, dots uh, showing here, showing that uh, the, uh, this reservoir are suffered in the problem of cyanobacteria, housing and tissue compounds. Okay, so when we take a look in the, about the cyanobacteria, this are under uh, a microscope, you can see uh, this uh, represent a different kind of cyanobacteria. And uh, the lower one is, the lower ones are uh, the SEM uh, photos, you know, taken uh, for the you know, same species of cyanobacteria. So what are the problems about cyanobacteria? Uh, let's you know, for uh, photo represent a common uh, toxic or uh, taste and odor uh, producing uh, cyanobacteria. Uh, when uh, you grow, when they have a lot of you know, green together, you form a floating uh, a mat or forming the uh, colony and floating on top of the uh, water uh, showing here. And what are the issues uh, so, uh, caused by this in the sound of bacteria if they present uh, in drinking water uh, sources? I think for drinking water treatment, one of the problems is that they will cause the clogging of the filter. So they will increase the operational cost 
because you need to backwash you know, quite frequently. And then uh, in order to remove this cyanobacteria, you have to add more chemicals such as coagulants, or you have to add more uh, disinfection, uh, disinfectants. Okay, so the increase in the operational cost. It also alters the drinking water quality because if you add more, uh, uh, like in you know, chlorine, for example, and you will produce more disinfection byproducts such as you know, THM, HA, and others. And but one of the uh, uh, important issue that you know uh, my research group is interested in is about the toxin and tensile nuclear compounds because many of this sound of bacteria may produce you know cyanotoxin as well as the uh, tensile nuclear compound. This slide shows the common sound of bacteria metabolized present or produced by uh, by sound of bacteria and present in Taiwan. The first one is the cyano uh, is the microsystem. This is a HEPA toxin. And it can, uh, it's a suspected uh, uh, carcinogenic compound uh, for, for human uh, labor. The drinking water standard is one microgram per liter. And then also the cylindrosperm mobsing. This is another compound. Uh, it's quite often, you know, uh, to be, to, to be uh, found in many drinking water sources. Okay, it can influence the uh, liver and gastrointestinal, you know, uh, organs. And the third one is the sexy toxin, which is the uh, neurotoxin. And it's, it's less common in Taiwan, but it has been found in many other you know, countries. Besides this toxin, there are two very uh, frequently detected uh, testing nodal compound called jasmine and MIB. I think in many Western countries, you know, jasmine is probably more frequently detected, but in, like in Taiwan and many Asian countries, two MIB is more uh, frequently uh, detected. I'm pretty much sure that you, know, you must have an experience of eating the freshwater fish, uh, such as you know, tilapia or lost you know, grow in the river. And sometimes if, if you can you know, find out the must, earthy, musty odor present in the fish, uh, let me tell you that about 90% to 95% of you know, possibility would be either to it might be in jasmine. And another example is that uh, in, uh, if you are working on a yacht and, and after a sunny day and suddenly it lays a, a red, you know, uh, drop into the yacht and you can smell some earthy odor coming from the, the, the land, right? Or, or your yacht. And it's very likely to be at least two compound too because, you know, some salopetia or echinomyces, they can produce these two compound in the land and then they will be absor absorbed by the uh, soil. And, and because of the water coming in and then it will dissolve it. So you can smell in the, uh, from the air. And these are the major uh, uh, sound of bacteria metabolite we study. And besides this, we also have studied some uh, new uh, metabolites, but I, you know, I won't you know, speak this you know, uh, for today. Okay, so uh, in my uh, research group, uh, we have uh, studied three kinds of technology, including uh, monitoring technology management of uh, source water as well as the water uh, treatment uh, technology. And I will talk more about the monitoring technology today and a bit about water treatment technology for today. All right, so when we, uh, when the water uh, reservoir manager, if they found some, uh, algal bloom, such as the photo uh, showing here. So what will they do? They will probably uh, take the sample and then uh, send the sample back to the laboratory for analysis. And once the lab found out there are some uh, toxins and or taste and odor compound present uh, in the reservoir, they will trigger the response to action. But unfortunately, it is usually take about 24 to 48 hours, especially for a big country like Indonesia. And then uh, by the time you, know, you give the results, then uh, the water may already come into uh, the drinking water system. So it's you know, sometimes too, too slow uh, for the response action. Another reason is that, another problem is that uh, the most commonly used method is the microscope uh, observation of the potential uh, toxin or taste and common producers. But unfortunately, uh, for these two uh, photos, they show the same species, but one of them can produce testing, the other one cannot. So it's very difficult for us to, you know, to differentiate that just simply based on the microscope method. 
And the other uh, problem for microscope method is that, as I mentioned, that it needs very professional experiences for someone who, uh, who should be trained for a certain amount of time so they will be able to differentiate this other bacteria uh, species. And then, uh, because under microscope, uh, it's sometimes very difficult to count, for, for example, such as the photo on this one and this one. It's a kind of a, a three-dimensional one, so you have to adjust the uh, focus. And also, doing the cell count is very time-consuming. So there are different uh, methods besides the uh, uh, microscope, such as the chemical method using the LCMS and GCMS to detect dusting and test a nodal compound, but it's usually expensive for the analysis. And you can use the immunoassay method, such as ELISA. It's very similar to what you do for the uh, for the, the kid to test the COVID-19. And, and, but, uh, but you have to select the different kind of uh, uh, kit, you know, in order to detect different kind of, a, of toxin. And unfortunately, there is no ELISO method available for, for the measurement of MIB producers or MIB. And for MIB and jasmine, the test the low compound, you can probably use the sensory meso. And if, uh, for someone who has been well-trained, you might be able to detect the concentration to a very low, but usually also taking you know, a long time you know, to do that. So, so what we are uh, interested in, uh, in doing is that, uh, what about if we combine biomolecular meso We're using the QBCR or other uh, newly uh, developed meso, biomolecular meso to detect the genes that are responsible for production of this cytotoxin and taste and nodal compound. And then uh, we might be able to, you know, uh, to provide a different uh, type of approach to detect the, uh, uh, the problem. So give you a background about the uh, molecular biology. We know that if you have DNA, then you might be transcribed uh, to RNA once it's functioning. And then this RNA can be translated uh, to produce uh, protein. For cyanotoxin, it's a kind of a protein. And for tetan nodal compound, it requires specific protein to produce this tetan nodal compound. So if we are able to kind of quantify DNA, then we will be able to quantify the uh, production uh, potential for the uh, cyanotoxin bacteria in the water for specific tetan nodal compound or for specific uh, toxin. If you detect RNA, that means you know, uh, we, we are able to know who are functioning, who are producing the toxin or who are producing the, uh, the taste and nodal compound. If we pro detect the protein, then that means you know, those that have been produced, such as uh, microcystin or, or other you know, tesin, or other toxins. Okay, let me start with the, uh, uh, one of the uh, paper uh, we published you know, uh, quite a long time ago. It's a monitoring of uh, jasmine producing uh, genes using PCR. And what we did is that this is one of my students who study in, uh, who visit Australia and, and they have a problem of jasmine. So we, uh, we uh, took the sample and back to the uh, laboratory for the analysis. And for each sample, we divide it into three parts. One is the, uh, uh, we, we monitor it uh, with the GCMS to quantify the jasmine concentration. And the second one is that we use the uh, microscope to eliminate the potential uh, producers. And the third one is that we use QBCR, try to quantify the genes responsible for production of this you know, jasmine uh, chemicals. Then we do try to compare these three type of technologies to see if they, uh, they can be correlated to each other. So showing uh, here represent that in the red bar, we, uh, we took samples at three different locations and each uh, we took about seven samples in about one month of time. And then we make a correlation uh, of the samples. Uh, here we designed two different uh, primer sets, try to quantify the genes. Okay, so the horizontal axis represent the gene concentration to quantify those you know, uh, producer producing uh, sound of bacteria. And the uh, vertical axis represent the cell concentration counted with the microscope. So you can see that their correlation are, are reasonably well. So the gene meso can quantify uh, the uh, cell numbers. And then 
then we uh, also compare the jasmine concentration measure with the GCMS, which is on the vertical axis, compared with the uh, uh, gene method for primary set one and primary set two, as well as the microscope innovation. And you can see that the microscope actually provide, you know, a, a very good result, 20 by the gene, sorry, 20 by the MIB con uh, jasmine concentration. A primer also give a very good, uh, good result. Uh, one, one, one thing I wish you bear in mind is that if you use biomolecular maser for each sample, you need about two to three hours to do the finishing analysis. And for microscope, uh, for each sample, it takes about one hour you know, to do the cell enumeration. However, for microscope, you can only do the analysis one sample each time. But for this, you know, uh, QBC are made, so you can analyze up to 96 samples uh, for each time. So you can analyze all the samples in three hours for 96 samples. So it, it does provide some advantage if you have a lot of samples need to be analyzed using this approach. Okay, so what uh, what we uh, do uh, using this method is that we kind of uh, integrate different experimental devices into a mobile vehicle. For example, include PCR, include ELISA reader and microscope and, and some uh, water quality uh, uh, probe as well as the animal meters. So we, we drive the vehicle to uh, the reservoir. So if this reservoir had problem, then we drive this you know, into there and, and do the analysis uh, right next to the reservoir and give them the result in two to three hours. And so the reservoir have the uh, confidence to see that you know, if their water is clean or not. So, so this you know, has been uh, used in Taiwan for, for about almost you know, 10 years. So in the last 10 years, so we used this application and to sample 29 reservoirs, including the DNA as well as the water quality for Taiwan. And, and uh, this is the uh, uh, Kinmen and Mazu uh, area with more than uh, 1,000 1, applications. So we have construct a lot of information uh, for this. Okay, so, so this, the, uh, this represent uh, the, uh, uh, the correlation between the MIB as mentioned, this is the uh, test and compound uh, between the G GCMS measurement as well as the uh, intracellular, uh, as well as the gene uh, measurement. So they all correlate uh, reasonably uh, well. And so what we can do is that uh, if we quantify the gene concentration, we'll be able to understand, to estimate how much MIB are present inside the cell and how much to MIB are in the water. So this will give some uh, the water utility to trigger layer uh, control uh, kind of activity and about how to uh, optimize the operation to remove this chemical. And we also try to uh, separate into uh, three locations. One is the entire one, and then compare the uh, uh, micro and the microscope with the DNA and microscope, and compare the uh, uh, micro and the testing you know, between DNA and, and, and gene, and also the cylindrous mammopsin and cylindrous mammopsis cell, as well as the MIB gene and MIB uh, concentration. They all have you know, very reasonably good you know, correlation. This is for the reservoirs in Taiwan. And for reservoirs in Kinmen, we also see a similar results uh, showing here for microcystine, cylindrous mammostine, and 2MIB. And this is for uh, the Mazu Island. And also uh, uh, similarly, uh, except that it, because we don't really have too much information for cylindrous mammostine and cylindrous mammostine, so we have fewer data for this. And also this one has been applied to uh, different, uh, to other different countries, uh, such as uh, in Philippines. So if you can see that in Philippines, we also see a very good uh, result between the uh, micro cells and micro uh, for the genes, and also the uh, MIB gene and MIB concentration uh, showing here. So, so it shows that you know, this technology can be used you know, to help the water ability to know what are the producers in their, uh, in their uh, water and how to improve that. 
Okay, so the next one is that uh, also focusing on taste and odor compound in drinking water. So what we did is that we uh, we write a book together with uh, the international uh, association experts uh, in different uh, uh, countries. And then uh, we also write uh, the uh, uh, review papers. So from what uh, our, uh, from what we uh, collect the data, we found that the, uh, the number of paper uh, published since 1990 has been increased dramatically. For example, in 1990, uh, the paper published relevant to judgment and it might be only less than 10 paper each year. But now in 2020, 2020, 2019, it's more than 100 papers already. So, so what we did is that we actually uh, construct a database because you know for for anyone who want to study the uh, uh, judgment to might be uh, issues, they have to go to the database and try to find out what are the uh, uh, major uh, uh, papers you know, available in the literature. So what we did is that we actually uh, we actually uh, construct a database as shown here. So if you are interested, uh, you can go to uh, this database and to you can link this, and it will come up with a a world map like this one. Here we provide a lot of information. We, we collect all the paper published after 1990 and ping, ping the point based on the location of the, uh, the, uh, the episode happens in the, uh, in the Google map. And if you, can, if you click into any one of these points, it will show that what are the, uh, uh, the case you know, study and when is the uh, survey year, and when's the paper published? And what are the major speed, major compound, you know, study here? And what kind of meso? Do they use that, you know, for example, QBCR meso, or they use the uh, uh, the uh, GCMS meso to do the uh, analysis? And you can also see that, you know, the the uh, the, the red one represent this is only for jasmine. And then the uh, blue one represent this is for me, uh, sorry, the red one represent for MIB and the blue one represent for Jasmine and the green one represent for uh, both cases. So, so this will provide very kind of interactive user-friendly map and open access you know, uh, platform for your reference. All right, and based on that, so we also do some analysis, for example, uh, for uh, Jasmine analysis using uh, the biomolecular meso PCR, and these are the genes you know, they use to detect uh, for, jas for jasmine. And, and also the jasmine produced by uh, some of the bacteria and by echinomyces, the gene arrangement are slightly uh, different. So, so uh, we collect all the information and found out that you know, they are 132 some of bacteria strains from 21 genera has been reported to produce jasmine MIB. But only 15, eight sequences were assembled in the NCBI database. And then we make a comparison, we can group them into 24 different groups of, of uh, jasmine producers. And then uh, uh, for those, you know, kind of design uh, the primers in the, in the literature, about 11 primers prop set has been developed. But unfortunately, none of them can detect all the different species. For example, all different groups of, of jasmine uh, producers. So zero represent is 100% uh, match. So you can see that there's no red coloring across all the 24 uh, group of uh, jasmine producers. For MIB, uh, this is the MIB uh, producing uh, genes. And, and also uh, the MIB producing, pro producing gene for some bacteria it's actually the arrangement is slightly different to the echinomyces. They're actually uh, kind of a, uh, alternate arrangements. And these are the uh, uh, countries who actually publish you know, those papers for the just MIB producers. We're using a similar method to analyze how many species and how many strains are reported in the literature. Actually, there are 70 uh, sound bacteria strains from 13 genera has been reported in the literature. And only 28 of the sequence has been assembled in the NCBI uh, database. And they can divide it into eight different uh, groups. And again, there are 11 primary and probe uh, sets 
will develop, try to quantify this H different group of uh, MIB producer. The good news is that three of them, three of the uh, primary pop state were able to quantify almost all the eight group of uh, jasmine uh, uh, pro uh, MIB producer. That means, you know, uh, the variation of the gene for jasmine is much more kind of uh, uh, complicated than, than, than MIB. So this has been uh, publishing uh, uh, water research. So, so what do we do about this for the next step? So I mentioned that uh, we have some uh, primer, they are able to uh, detect all the uh, uh, gene, you know, all the jasmine, uh, it might be producing gene for the eight uh, different groups. But unfortunately, we don't really know about which one is which because in order to control the, uh, uh, the responsible sound of bacteria, you have to know which species or which strength or which, you know, at this, which genus it, is that? Because they might need, you know, different uh, type of uh, uh, nutrient or different type of uh, light condition. So if you know, you know, which one is that, then you'll be able to kind of uh, uh, have a better uh, control strategy. So what we did is that uh, we, uh, in, our, in our lab, we have uh, five different uh, strength, uh, standard uh, strength belong to five different groups. So we will do a test. They actually, uh, the gene, you know, among them for the uh, 308 base pair, relevant to the jasmine producing uh, section, uh, sorry, it might be producing uh, section. They have some, you know, differences. For example, uh, some of them had 92% uh, similarity. Some of them have even 95% uh, similarity. So we try to see if we are able to develop a technique to separate them. So what we did is that we used the nano pole, uh, which is a, a relatively you know, inexpensive uh, next generation uh, sequencing uh, type of method. So we run all the uh, sequence through this nano pole and try to compare with the, uh, uh, the database we have established, try to understand what kind of a sound of bacteria is that and uh, who is responsible for producing of two gene uh, in the water. So, so what we did uh, over here is that we test with the uh, known two MIB sequences. Uh, what we did is that we, for example, we uh, mix the um, uh, known group. For example, group one, 50%, group two, 50%. And the test two is group five and group eight. And then the last test will be that we mix all these five different uh, group of uh, MIB producers and try to see if we are able to use this narrow pore to quantify that. So this show you uh, the result that we have. For example, the, this is the test one. We mix two different groups and they each represent 50%. And this is uh, slightly you know, uh, uh, different, but still quite close to 50 to 50. And this is the mixture of three different groups. And this is a mixture of five different groups. So, so that means you know, using this technique, we are able to differentiate the uh, two might be producing cyanobacteria and then the water, the reservoir and the water utility will be able to know what are the target sound of bacteria so they can select a profit control major, try to control the sound of bacteria. And we use a similar technique and using in the, uh, uh, the source tracking of the uh, bacteria coming uh, from the uh, river. And this is one of the study uh, we recently uh, done. It's, a, it's a from a river called uh, Jisui River uh, near uh, Tainan. And we took two samples A and B in here and around this in a sample of location, they actually have cow and poultry farm. And also because the river also, uh, also uh, run through uh, the township. So we also have some human uh, pollution uh, coming uh, from the, that, you know, uh, for the river. So if you take a look at A and B over here, we take two different samples. The black one represents human sources of E. coli as well as the uh, another you know, bacteria. And then uh, the white one represents uh, poultry. And this, the, again, and this, the, this uh, uh, brown one represents those you know, from the cow. And the red part represent, uh, we took the, uh, we used the membrane, the conventional method to do the analysis. It shows that, Indeed, you know, for this, you know, to, uh, for this river, the poultry, cow, and human are responsible for the uh, microbes 
present in the water. And this is for the second part is for the G3 River, another, you know, G3, another section for G3 River. And you actually see that the response for uh, the, the source is actually including uh, the, uh, the cow, okay, and the human. And for Yenstrai River, the third part, third, third section of uh, third part of the river uh, shows the different kind of uh, sources. Uh, besides a uh, human, you also see the the white one, which is the poultry. And in fact, we also see you know uh, the poultry farm you know near uh, this you know river as well as you know it's run through a urban section. And the, the fourth one is Baisheri River. It's in a, a more kind of a, a rural uh, area. And you see that they actually, uh, the major one is the uh, uh, poultry uh, of the, uh, uh, in the in, observed in the river. So the importance of this one is that you can, we can use this micro, microbial method to do the analysis for, for you know, to, to, su to suggest in the local uh, environmental protection uh, agency where are the sources and what kind of sources they should be uh, uh, watching and they should you know, try to control to protect the river water quality. All right, and the next one I'm going to uh, spend a little bit of time is to introduce the uh, water treatment uh, technology. Okay, this is shows the conventional water treatment process from coagulation, flocculation, sedimentation, filtration, chlorination, and then go to the finished water. So uh, for, for water uh, with the uh, algal bloom and the algae, you know, looks like this, for example. And then if you have pre-chlorination on here, you would actually uh, rupture the cell and causing the release of the metabolite uh, into uh, the water, then they will complicate the treatment in the following process. So, so this shows the uh, uh, an SEM uh, photo for an abina. This is before oxidation. And um, okay, it looks like you know very beautiful. It looks like the necklace uh, under scanning electron microscope. But if, if if they are in contact with the one milligram of chlorine in what one minute, you see that the cell will be ruptured quickly. So you'd expect that metabolite inside here will be released into the water. So we have uh, a few examples of this you know, experience. This is one of uh, experience in Mazu Island is a, in a small island. And, and the, this reservoir is their major uh, drinking uh, water uh, sources. So, so one day uh, we received a phone call from the local government. They asked us to try to help them to identify the problem in the reservoir. So uh, what we did is that we, run, uh, uh, we went there, we flew to there and bring our equipment and using the ELISA to major the toxins and which is okay, we found that the microcystin, syringe, mammoxin, and texitacin, they all be left below detection limit. Although they have a small amount of uh, microcystin you know, producing gene, but which is okay because the concentration is quite low. But for the GCMS detection, we actually found they have very high concentration of MIB concentration. And a lot of them are actually uh, uh, inside and outside the uh, cell the sales and the MIB gene concentration was very high. It tend to uh, force, you know, uh, copies per CC, which represent a very high concentration. So one number I would like you to remember is that uh, between zero meter and three meter, actually their water intake is about two meter. So you would expect two MIB concentration would be between 500 and 160. And another thing to remind you is that the uh, older threshold concentration is 10 nanogram per liter. That means, you know, for, for people, if the concentration is lower than 10 nanogram per liter, they cannot smell it. But if it's higher, then you'll be able to smell it. Okay, so, so this shows the, the, the sample we took. So we took the raw water. You can actually see from the slide that the, the water is quite green, right? So that means a lot of algae are present in there. And the raw water concentration is about 240 for the total, remember that we mentioned in the previous slide that the concentration should be between 160 and 500. So this is correct. And the dissolved concentration is only 40. That means most of the, the MIB are present inside the cell. However, after coronation, everything coming to the water, okay? The total concentration is equal to the 
dissolved in MIB concentration. And then coagulation, sedimentation, filtration, and finished water. You actually see that finished water concentration, dissolved phase and total MIB concentration are almost equal to loss in the, in the total country in the lower. That, that means what? There's no removal at all you know, for the fish water. And one interesting thing is that, you know, because my students, when they went there to do the sample, and they actually uh, buy the local uh, soybean milk making from the water over there, we took that, you know, back to the lab for analysis, which is about 300 milligrams per liter. It's very smelly. So the student did not drink the soybean milk and bring back to the lab for analysis. Another thing, you know, uh, uh, this will give, you know, very high pressure to the uh, local people uh, there. So if you go back to uh, see uh, this, this one, this is the uh, reservoir. The water treatment plant is around this area. So the main street on the island is located in the area. So everyone, you know, uh, the operator of the water treatment uh, facility, you know, everyone, when they go back home, you know, all the people are saying to them, oh, your water is very smelly. So give them very high pressure of that. Okay, so, so this shows the, uh, uh, the constraining change along, along the treatment trend. So original in the raw water, the majority of the MIB was inside the cell, but after chlorination, it actually uh, become the dissolved phase because cell was ruptured. Then along the treatment process, there is no removal efficiency at all for the chemicals. So, so what we suggest is that uh, because the, uh, uh, we suggest them not to use the preconation and they should try to use enhanced coagulation so they can reduce the majority of the MIB uh, to become only a, a dissolved phase only. But even for the dissolved phase, you know, because it's higher than 50 nanogram per liter, they should try to use some other uh, measures such as the uh, uh, powder activated carbon or activated carbon try to remove that. And, and, and also, they, of course, they can try to change the uh, uh, source water. Okay, then I will give you a few uh, quick examples of other you know, uh, study that we have done try to improve the uh, drinking water supply. Uh, for example, that's, this is one of the uh, reservoir in southern uh, part of Taiwan. The, the source water for this reservoir actually is you know, suffer from pollution of ammonia. So we have the water supply cooperation to run a, a pilot scale uh, study and then uh, using the biological uh, uh, method try to uh, oxidize the uh, ammonia into nitrate and also remove that, you know, uh, remove, uh, also uh, oxidize to uh, nitrogen uh, for a certain ratio. And this has been in commission uh, to move to a full scale water treatment plant and the capacity is about 300 thousand cubic meter uh, a day. So, so this is the operation uh, kind of a, a result. For example, the original uh, water quality and uh, ammonia is higher than eight milligram per liter, but after operation it's lower, always lower than uh, one uh, milligram per liter, which is a standard of source water quality in Taiwan. And so we construct an operational line for them. This is the hydraulic retention time for the uh, reactor. And this is the inference uh, ammonia concentration. For one, for for uh, inference concentration, inference concentration of six uh, milligram per liter of ammonia, you can maintain one hour of uh, hydraulic retaining time. Then you can uh, always control the ammonia concentration lower than uh, one milligram per liter. But if your concentration is higher, then you should try to either increase the hydraulic retaining time. Otherwise, your efferent ammonia concentration would be higher. And then uh, we also uh, calculate the removal efficiency for COD, so your COD, uh, TOC uh, in this you know, water treatment plant. And I also like to spend maybe three to four minutes to, to introduce uh, some collaboration with hydraulic engineering. All right, so this is the, uh, uh, the study uh, done at the uh, Tana Hydraulic uh, Lab. They try to use the water intake, you know, uh, kind of a gravitational uh, force uh, separation, try to separate water and silt. And if you see this, you know, uh, video, you can actually see that the clean water come into the reservoir and the water is sealed actually bypassed. 
Okay, so since the operation, uh, we have you know uh, collect about 150 mega liter per year uh, for for this you know specific you know uh, reservoir. Another case uh, we recently did is that uh, we try to simulate, we try to combine the uh, uh, bubbling and shear stress calculation for membrane bioreactor. And so they will be able to simulate the energy saving and, and falling uh, reduction. So the idea is that uh, we try to control the bubble and to measure the shear stress along the membrane wall so that we will reduce the falling. And this will uh, have the kind of a, uh, the efficiency for energy you know, uh, saving as well as the uh, uh, good control uh, with the uh, uh, AI. So what we did uh, over here is that you can see that on the right hand side, this is the uh, numerical model together with the experimental comparison. You see that the bubble actually was simulated very well by the uh, numerical uh, uh, models. So this is in the, uh, uh, in the clean water. So the next step is go to the uh, sludge. So here it shows that uh, the results, you know, we try to simulate uh, under very high concentration of active sludge, such as this 7,000 milligram per liter of MLSS, and this is 17,000 milligram per liter of MLSS. And you can actually see that, you know, the simulation are uh, also uh, reasonably uh, well. So we can translate those, you know, uh, data into the flow field. Okay, we compare uh, the uh, uh, the video information as well as the uh, uh, computer uh, uh, simulation. And then uh, finally, we make it a, a, a three-dimensional simulation of non-Newton uh, fluid. So we use the uh, uh, CFD uh, simulation to compare with the uh, uh, the video we take we took you know for the same kind of a device, and and we found that you know the results are quite similar to uh, the uh, the computer simulation result are very similar to uh, to this experimental result. So the important thing for this is that uh, we are able to then you know calculate the CO stress produced at different energy uh, uh, input and different uh, bubbles. So then we'll be able to calculate how easy the falling of the power beam on the uh, membrane wall. So that will save us you know, a lot of energy you know, if you can uh, uh, control that. Okay, uh, one last thing I would like to uh, share with you is that uh, we are going to organize the nice IWS5 conference and exhibition in 2023. Originally, this was supposed to be uh, held in uh, last, last year. But due to the pandemic condition, so we uh, postponed to uh, October 22nd to 25th. It will be held in Kaohsiung. So we'll announce this very uh, soon. And I uh, cordially invite all of you to come to Taiwan uh, to join uh, the conference. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Professor Lin, for a very comprehensive and a very uh, practical um, lecture of today. And as you have stated earlier, that is cyanobacteria is brings us a very um, dangerous situation regarding the, uh, the safety of uh, drinking water, right? So, Professor Lin, and. Professor Lin, uh, let's uh, let's proceed to Q and A session. And now I would like to open the link for Q and A session. I would like to read the first questions from Dimas Aditya Wiridya Dinata from ITF, Mechanical Engineering. The question is: What is the most suitable visual inspection? for inspecting the river water in Asia. Please, Professor Lin. Uh, usually, uh, usually the, uh, the reservoir, uh, if they have, I think the reservoir has the problem and have you know, their own problem and shadow reservoir has their own problem. And uh, from my experiences, because I'm more focusing on uh, algae and cyanobacteria, usually uh, the shadow reservoir with long retention time 
would suffer more for cyanobacteria uh, problem. And that is because uh, usually for shadow reservoir, they have uh, like, you know, uh, uh, easy light penetration uh, to very uh, deep area. And for most of the uh, uh, reservoir in Asian uh, countries, uh, uh, because uh, our, our kind of uh, environment management, in particular those, you know, uh, uh, nutrient management are not as good as, you know, those in the Western uh, country. So, so I think nutrient is usually not a limitation factor for reservoir in uh, most Asian country. So I would say that, you know, uh, for, for like, you know, a shadow reservoir with long residence time, that would be the critical issue. I see, thank you very much uh, for your answer. And I would like to invite the asker, Dimas Aditya. Dimas Aditya, hello. Okay, are you, are you still there, Dimas Aditya? Okay, so Dimas Aditya is not right here right now. And I saw that Dr. Grandi raised hand. Please, Dr. Grandi. Good morning. Uh, good afternoon. Good evening, sir. Uh, your lecture is very comprehensive. Uh, these are about algae, right, sir? The blue-green algae? Yes. Okay. The microcystis and the cyanobacteria. Are these, uh, are these uh, algae dangerous to fish culture like tilapia, sir? Uh, no, uh, actually, uh, the photo you see, the photo you see in the Laguna de Bay, they actually uh, grow uh, tilapia, mm -hmm. right? And, yes. and we do detect uh, some uh, micros, uh, sorry, a lot of microcystis and there's another compound in Laguna de Bay. Yes, and sir. They, you can also actually find them in tilapia. Mm -hmm. uh... Sir, uh, spirulina also is uh, a blue-green algae, yes, and uh, they are making this or uh, into medicine, I hope. And how about this uh, microcystis, sir? Uh, uh, is there a beneficial effect to human health or uh, dangerous because of the jasmine? the toxin present in microcystis, sir? Uh, yes, uh, for like, you know, because uh, I, 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 I'm, you know, like an human engineer, so, so my focus is about, you know, how to monitor and treat the problem. Mm -hmm. and, and for microcystin, uh, I know some people, they are study, try to find out the beneficial uh, part of cyanotoxins. But probably mostly from uh, low signal toxin from uh, marine. Freshwater toxin, you know, uh, not that many people study this area. Probably more people study uh, the uh, uh, metabolite and, and toxins uh, from uh, marine water uh, algae or cyanobacteria. And, but uh, from what I know is that uh, low signal toxin nodal compound. Uh, because the concentration are very, very low in drinking water. So usually they don't really have health, kind of a, a too much health risk to human. Uh, it's a kind of a fatiguing problem because you can smell the water when you drink the water. And then, but for microcystin, it's, it's kind of a, it's considered as the uh, a carcinogenic compound. So it's a promoter for human carcinogen. So it's not really a very good uh, uh, compound uh, for, for uh, human health. And then uh, I also, you know, I, I also run a project, try to uh, find out the beneficial part of the, the sinocyanobacteria. For example, at some stage, people try to use them to produce uh, biofuel, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. But yeah, but the problem is that uh, uh, the energy you put 
to separate those algae from water is higher than the energy you collect, you harvest from them. So it's not, uh, I think it's still kind of a bottleneck over there. You know, it's the energy input is too much to produce biofuel using algae. Okay, sir, thank you. Thank you very much. And one thing thank more, you. sir. One thing more. Okay, thank um, you. It is our observation that uh, in our peace fund, there are a lot of microcystis and uh, sometimes it's not good for aquaculture. Is there a remedy, sir, to lessen the quantity of microcystis present in the water? Uh, yeah, there are some uh, methods, but it will really very, very kind of a source water or, or reservoir, you know, uh, dependent because different uh, reservoir may have different kind of uh, uh, sources. But the general rule of thumb is that if you can reduce, if you can reduce the uh, uh, nutrient con concentration in, in, the, uh, in the reservoir or in the, uh, in the pond, especially, especially uh, phosphorus concentration, then you can reduce the uh, intensity and the frequency of the algal bloom uh, happened. And of course, there are some other, you know, uh, some other uh, uh, methods, you know, uh, uh, you can use, for example, some people actually try to uh, cover uh, the reservoir with different uh, methods because some of the bacteria would need some light, right? And they also have some people using the uh, ultrasonic method or even using like, you know, a low dosage or zone. But it will be more expensive, I would say. Yeah. So depending on you know uh, how much uh, effort you could offer and how much and and the situation of the uh, uh, reservoir or the pond that you need to, to face with. Okay, sir. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Grandio, for your questions. It ignites a very fruitful discussion with also with Dr. Professor Lin. And Professor Lin, um, yes, uh, I would like to know uh, one thing uh, that, that you, you, you intend to uh, combine methods to analyze cyanobacteria, right? Uh, start from chemical LCMS and then immunoassay with ELISA and sensory with humans. So um, I would uh, we would like to know more about the combination of that. How is that going? How, how is the success? Rate of, of that that uh, combination of that method. Oh, okay, yeah. Uh, uh, actually, uh, as I mentioned that, I, I I'm actually uh, uh, studying from the engineering point of view. I'm an environment engineer, so so we usually uh, try to find out uh, uh, kind of an easy to use and cheaper and faster method. Try to identify you know uh, the problem. So so conventionally, people use the. Uh, uh, People use the microscope to do the analysis, so which is fast, of course, but you know it would require very uh, professional uh, expertise because not everyone can you know tell that. So so another approach you know commonly using nanochemist is that use the uh, uh, GCMS or LCMS to do the analysis, try to identify the metabolites, okay, such as toxins, and 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 the uh, uh, and other compounds. A microscope can give you the source, the uh, cyanobacteria, all right? And the chemical meso can help you to do the uh, metabolize. But, but such as uh, the other meso, such as ELISA, ELISA can give you the toxin, okay? So it's similar to LCMS, but it's cheaper, but it's not that precise. And then, and then uh, the, the, the uh, and also for test and other compounds, because you know, in my lab, I've trained a group of students who can smell to semi-quantify the concentration of taste and other compounds. But again, this you know need to be uh, needs to train. It's only semi-quantification uh, uh, type of method. So the reason we try to uh, develop the biomolecular method is that we want to go to the gene level and try to quantify how much genes present in the reservoir. And they are responsible for production of this, you know, taste and odor compound as well as toxin. So then uh, we, we use all the methods and try to compare uh, their kind of uh, advantage and disadvantage. We actually found out that they are, uh, they, they, their correlation are uh, quite well. So uh, 
uh, we have a mobile laboratory uh, to include, you know, important devices such as uh, such as microscope as ELISA as well as the uh, uh, PCR. So so we went to the reservoir and analyzed on the field using all the methods, so that you know uh, we can kind of uh, double check you know among the methods to make sure that our observation is correct. Thank you very much for your explanation of Brooklyn. Now I know why 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 uh, you are uh, very eager to want to combine this uh, human factor ELISA and LCM test and to double chain. Okay, this is new vocabulary for, for me also. Okay, so thank you very much, Brooklyn, and also Dr. Grande for a very amazing session today. I'm so excited. Thank you very much. And now we are now closing the Q&A session and now let's proceed to the next agenda, certificate awarding. So this is certificate for Professor Saif Wulin. Thank you. Okay, once again, thank you very much. Uh, thank you very, very, uh, we are very grateful for our session today. That is very amazing. And yes, uh, we believe that you, your both lecture will be very, very beneficial for our participants today and also for the goal of the SDGs in 2020, sorry, 2030. Thank you very much. And then, uh, let's move to the next agenda. So tomorrow we still have a one amazing agenda to GLS on SDGs at Thursday. So tomorrow SDGs will be discussed about SDG 7 and 13, 13 and it will be delivered by Dr. Yoon Hao from City University Hong Kong. And not only that, we also will have Mr. Dan Utomo, PhD from Harriet Watt University. So make sure you don't miss it. And we will see you again on the next GLS on SDG. So don't forget to follow our social media at Instagram, ITS International Office, also Facebook, facebook.com, IOITS, and also YouTube, ITS International Channel. Okay, before we end the session, I would like to invite you all to open your camera and we will have a group photo session. Okay, since we have three slides here, I would like to capture three times. This is the first slide. Um, okay, everyone's ready. One, two, three. Okay, and second slide. One, two, three. And the third slide. One, two, three. Okay, so now that's the end of our group photo session. Thank you very much once again to our participants. And don't forget to fill in the feedback form that our committee has bring it in the chat box. And also, once again, thank you very much to our speakers. Prof. Lin and also Dr. Grande, thank you very much. We hope to see you again in the next opportunity and collaboration. Thank you very much. And GLS on SDGs will be back next week. See you. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Prof. Okay, allow me to end the session in three, 